Good morning, Life Church. Will you stand as we learn a new song this morning? I have been saved by the grace of God, and man, I have been raised with a future without end. I set my eyes on a true and loyal friend. Who's alive? I'm hidden in Jesus. All my hope in Jesus. Love that never leaves us. You won't forsake us now, Jesus.
Hi, good morning. Good to see everybody here at our main campus. Welcome to you guys that are joining us online. So real quick, before we get started, uh, we had an announcement last week. I want to remind you again this week, we're going to be 
uh, opening up a second service, per se, or a second opportunity for our children's ministry. So starting on April the 10th, we will have children's ministry during our 930 service, which we haven't had a full children's ministry during that time. But as the church grows and as God continues to do uh, amazing things, we want to provide more opportunities uh, to be able to reach kids and to be able to uh, influence them in incredible ways. So with that, we need volunteers, right? So the way you can volunteer, sign up on the app. So if you have the app, we'd love for you to be able to, to sign up on that. If you don't have the app or you can't figure it out, don't let that deter you um, from being a part of our children's ministry. Grab a Connect card at the back and you can fill it out and then somebody will get a hold of you. So if you can't figure out the app part of it. But again, just as a reminder, you know, we feel like uh, it's not just bringing kids in and, and crowd control. Like, we want to give these kids every opportunity to know Jesus and understand the love of Christ. And they understand that through the people that are with them, right? And the people that can give them an example of what that looks like. So just asking if you'll be a part of that and help us uh, be able to get that done. All right, so... We're in Revelation, so I'm going to give you a quick recap because we can't go all the way through it. Um, But as I'm giving the recap, I want you to turn to Revelation 3, uh, and it's going to be 7 through 13, and also Hebrews 11, and it's going to be verses 1 through 16. Okay, so those uh, two verses we're going to be looking at today. One will be up on the screen, the Revelation, obviously. Hebrews is one that I'm going to refer to, uh, but I want you to either write it down, find it, mark it, you know, so that you can go back to it, because it's going to be one you're going to have to continue uh, to process. So here's the thing to be thinking about. So in every one of the letters, right, that, uh, that we're reading or studying, at the end of it, it always says the same thing. It gives the same warning. If you have ears, you better hear, you better listen, you better do something about it, right? That's what it says. So if you are here and you are listening, whether you like this or not, you're accountable that now you hear it, and the question is, what are you going to do about it, right? So you can't plead ignorance anymore to the fact of saying, well, I didn't really know that this is what God said about these things. So in every one of the letters, he's essentially saying, like, you, if you hear this, you should do something about it. And if you don't, right, there's some warnings inside of it, right? So there's some warnings inside of each one of the letters, but also you're going to see some warnings that come in the rest of the book of Revelations. Because in the beginning when we started this, it was like, I'm going to do the seven letters, right? And then I'm going to kind of see how it goes because you never know how a church responds to teaching Revelation. You know what I mean? Because some people are like, okay, this is terrible, right? And some people are like, love it. So most of the response of what we got has been like, this has been helpful. This has brought clarity. And so we're going to teach all the way through. So we're going to keep teaching the book of Revelation and keep going with it. So here's the other part of it. He gives you some warnings inside of it that would say, if you don't listen, here's some things that's going to happen, right? You see a side of Jesus that maybe you've never seen before, the the whole like wrath judgment side, you know, but inside of it, you see the grace side. If you do repent, there's going to be revival. There's going to be change, right? Both of those things. But he says, here's the deal. And you might not like to hear this, but if you are listening, hearing, and doing nothing about it, there's a good chance that the second part of Revelations you're going to experience because you're probably not a believer. No, I know. That's, I was wondering how many people would give me that look, and you just went ahead and said it, right? <laughs> but that's the point. What he's saying is, is that at the end of every book, there's this realization is you probably should look at yourself. And if, and if you're looking at this and you're saying, like, I know what it says, but I don't really want to do it, or I know what it says, but I don't want to go down those roads, or I know what it says, but I don't really care, the question for all of us should be why. Right? Like, if you, if you are a believer, why wouldn't you care that this is what he's saying to you and this is what he wants you to change in your life? Because in each one of the letters, he says the same thing. Recognizing that you're wrong isn't the problem. Not repenting is the problem. Right? Like, if you really admit that you're not where you need to be, all he says is, it's okay. Like, you can repent. Things can change. We can have revival. We can change the things in your heart. Just change. Stop saying you're sorry. Stop walking out of every message. And Wow, he just beat me up today. I mean, nothing's going to change, but he beat me up today, right? Like, the message was so hard. I mean, it didn't change anything, 
right? He's saying when the message is hard and the Holy Spirit convicts you, then just do something about it. Like repent and change your ways. That's the whole first part of Revelation, right? The letters that we're reading and then what we're going to be studying in the future because that's the, the, what's happening at the time is like uh, the section of what is in Revelation, meaning it was happening at the time. He was writing it down. They were given the letters. What we're going to be studying is what's to come, right? So this is going to be all the things that are going to be happening uh, in the future. So when we look at it today, we're going to, again, continue to process because this letter ends the same as every one of the letters. If you have ears, you should hear and you should probably do something about it, right? And that's our prayer inside of this. So Revelation 3, we're going to read all the way through it, Revelation 3, 7 through 13, After we read through it, we're going to give this recap, like this is what the big picture of the letter looks like, and then we're going to try to use then the Hebrews uh, scripture, so if you're going to be following along, that's where we're going to go to Hebrews and look, Um, so if you have your marker in there, it'll be right after we read this, and then start processing it, what he's saying to each one of us, and then break it down from there. So Revelation 3, starting in verse 7. To the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, these are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, no one can shut, and what he shuts, no one can open. I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word, and you have not denied my name. I will make those who are are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars. I'll make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. I'm coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one can take your crown. The one who is victorious, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. Never again will they leave it. I will write on them the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which is coming down out of heaven from my God. And I also write on them my new name. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So in there, two big points that we want to look at. The first one is the church in Smyrna and the church in Philadelphia were the only churches that God looked at and said, you have some imperfections, but we're really not even going to talk about them because what you're doing as a whole overcomes the imperfections inside of the church. Because here's what we know. If you're going to go to church, it's always going to have problems, right? Right? If you've come to church long enough, if you go to church long enough, you're going to have issues. Like there's just problems in the church, especially, you know, if you do a church that cares about relationships because relationships are messy. You know what I mean? Like if you do a church where you actually talk to each other, you know, and you have relationship with each other inside of relationship, things at times get difficult. Things at times get hard, right? So we know that through that, there were some imperfections, but in the church of Smyrna, because they were overcoming persecution, right? God said like, we don't need to look at your imperfections. We're going to highlight what you're doing well. And we're going to highlight and talk about the things that you are really good at, right? And we're going to highlight those to the rest of the churches. Well, in the church of Philadelphia, it was the same way. They had imperfections, they had problems, but they did have something, you know, in their church to be able to highlight that overcame all of the small problems, right? And in that, they were the church of people who were called to be faithful. They were called the faithful church, right? So the church of Philadelphia called to be the faithful church because the church itself and the people inside of the church were called faithful. Now, I want to spend some time talking about that because I think this gets lost in translation at times. You know, like we talk a lot about like at the end of your life, everybody wants to be found faithful, right? Or everybody wants to live by faith, right? And, and we want to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant, right? But do we really know what faith is? Like when you think about this, I think the word gets thrown out a lot. And I think a lot of people talk about like, I want to be faithful and I I want to live a life of faith, but I don't know that we completely understand what it means to live by faith. In fact, I would say one of the problems with American Christianity is this, is that you have saving faith, but when it comes to living faith, it doesn't exist, right? Meaning this. I think there are a lot of people 
that if you said today, here's the choice between heaven and hell, right? You have a choice, right? Like, let me give you this message today. Here's the choice, heaven and hell, right? And, and if you believe in Jesus, you go to heaven. If you believe, you know, don't believe in Jesus, you go to hell, right? And these are the two pictures. How many people would believe in Jesus? Yeah, the only people that wouldn't are the people that, you ever hear people talk about like, you know, I don't know, I don't mind going to hell because I'm going to go to hell and have a party with my friends. And I'm like, dude, you do not know what hell is like then. You're stupid. I mean, that's not hell, all right? Hell is not a party with your friends, right? Hell is not a place that the bad boys go and the good boys go to heaven, right? That's not what it is. So if you put it out there, this whole idea of make a decision, you know, to do this based upon where you're going to go, do you realize that that's nowhere in Scripture? Like nowhere in Scripture does it tell you to believe in Jesus so that you don't have to go to hell and you can't go to heaven. Nowhere. Like salvation was never presented that way. But because people present it that way, you get a lot of people that would be like, yeah, when I was 10, when I was 12, when I was 15, when I was 16, when I was 17, I got baptized and now I'm good. But when it comes to living by faith, ah, I mean, I have to, right? Because they're two separate things. Acceptance of salvation and living by faith are two separate things. Like there's the people that give their life to Christ and then there's the really good people that live by faith. You know what I mean? Like they're all, they're saved. This is making any sense. I feel like this is getting confusing. Right, like the, the, the deal is, is like people see this separation. Like I can be the guy that I don't really care if I just sweep the floors when I walk in type of guy, you know? And then there's these like really good guys that actually go out and live by faith and they're gonna wanna have all the crowns, but I don't really care about a crown, right? Well, part of that is just an excuse to not live by faith. Like you're just giving this excuse of like you've been challenged to do something more and you don't want to really do it. So you just be like, well, you don't need to go down that road. But what I want you to see is salvation inside of scripture was never presented to keep you out of hell and move you into heaven. Salvation was presented to you to fix the problem that was broken in the beginning. What was the problem that was broken in the beginning? A relationship with God. That was broke. Right? It wasn't supposed to save you from anything. The idea was Adam and Eve were within a garden in relationship with God, and it was awesome. Sin happened. The relationship was broke. All of the Old Testament and then in the New Testament was, we got to fix the problem. How do you fix the problem? Jesus is the answer to fix the problem. When Jesus comes in his blood and you accept, right, you then will be in relationship with God, right? and you will seek a relationship with God. That's why, and I want to make sure you understand this. Anybody that's sitting here today that have made those two exclusively different and give my life to Jesus Christ and not live by faith, that's not faith. It's not. Because the idea of faith was to work on relationship, right? Like you can't have one mutually, mutually exclusive from the other. It makes no sense. If you're giving your life to Jesus Christ to fix a relationship, but you're going to do nothing in the relationship, that doesn't make any sense, right? Like if, you're, if you did this, if Jesus was supposed to fix the relationship, then in fixing the relationship, you would show that you love the one you fixed the relationship with by acting in faith, doing things, right? That's why I've always said, like this whole idea, working on a relationship, like Things by faith are working on a relationship, right? Like we do things and we trust that if we do these things, our relationship will grow, right? Yeah, I mean, that's the thing that's going to happen. That's why I always said, like, to all husbands and wives and to all people that are thinking about getting married, so if you're a young person and you're thinking about getting married, know this. Your husband or your wife or your future husband or your future wife will never be able to love you the way that you deserve until you have Jesus Christ in your life. It's completely impossible. Completely impossible. You'll never be able to do it, right? You'll never have what it takes to be able to give a relationship with somebody 
until you have a relationship with Jesus because you'll never understand the dynamic of relationship that makes relationships right, right? Meaning that when you learn to love Jesus Christ and be in relationship with him, you fix some things that are broken inside of you so that when you go to be in a relationship with someone else, you're not trying to fix the problem, right? Because that's why, you know, especially for young girls, sometimes they get with these guys and they're like, but I can fix him. I'm like, honey, <laughs> we're not very fixable. <laughs> like, we need to fix ourselves, right? Like, we need to do some things for ourselves. And that's why I'm saying, like, if you find a man that pursues a relationship with God with all of his heart, mind, and soul, I will guarantee you something. He will pursue you the way you deserve Find a man who does not pursue Jesus Christ, and I guarantee you, like he might be able to fake it for a while, but I guarantee you, over time, he will not pursue you the way that you deserve. And the same is the same way, same with women. God's like, pick a woman who desires to be in relationship with God, you know, that, that understands the foundation of what it takes. That's what we're trying to fix. Does that make sense? This whole idea of faith, relationship, what does it look like? We need to understand completely that those two things can't be separate. So what does it mean to be faithful? This is what Hebrews 11 teaches us. So we're going to go to Hebrews 11, 1 through 16, and what you're going to see is what I just said. Faith, meaning this idea of I want to get saved and not go to hell, over here, and people living by faith and that they're two separate things and at some point you'll get to one or the other is, is the Hebrews 11 shows it can't be true. They have to go together, right? And he's going to show that in the way that this happens. So listen to what it says, Hebrews 11, 1 through 16. It's not going to be up there, so I'll read it to you, but my suggestion would be is you should probably go back and look at these, right? Because here's what it says in the beginning. Hebrews 11, starting in verse 1, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith, we understand that the universe was formed by God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. Now he gives us an example, right? What does faith look like? By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of the offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks even though he is dead. From the beginning, look at Cain and Abel, right? This is very important to understand. Both of them had the same commandment, right? The commandment was to bring an offering. True, right? Commandment was to bring an offering. One was accepted and one wasn't, right? Now, you, you need to see this because this is the fallacy inside of the church that I want to make sure that we clear up. God accepted one and not the other. The reason that he did not accept the one is because the commandment of the offering had never changed. You are to give the first, not what's left over. So if you think that because you give part of your time, you give part of your money, you read the Bible some of your time, like if you think those things are what pleases God, you're missing the mark. You hear me? Like, the reason that it was accepted is because at the end of the day, Abel made a decision. I'm going to do something out of faith. Right? I'm going to do something out of faith. When you give your first and not what's left over, and when it costs you something, your faith's going to grow. Right? So was the offering the issue or was faith the issue? Faith. Right? And the reason that it wasn't accepted, and that's why I say sometimes we get, we get dismissed in church. Why well, was that church? Sometimes, I mean, the majority of the time, and I guess I got up and read my Bible and you know, at least I'm giving money. I used to never give any money before. Well, I don't know. Is that okay? Yeah. Is it okay? Like, is it okay that you just showed up here today? No, listen. You know what he's saying? Like, the reason that, that, that Abel gave something is because there was an expectation that on the other end of this, I'm going to meet him. I'm going to be there with him. There's going to be something on the other side of this. When I give my first, I'm going to, that's where God is. 
when I give what's left, I, I'm all on my own, right? And so that's why I always tell people, like, it's so weird to me that we would come without an expectation to, to meet the Lord here today. Like, if you came and your expectation was to stay awake, you might be missing it. I mean, I'm doing my best to keep you awake, you know, without calling you out when your head goes, hmm. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like we're trying to do the best, but I'm just going to tell you, it doesn't matter how good the preacher is. If you're not coming with an expectation where two or three are gathered, he's going to be here and you're coming here to meet him, right? Like if you're coming with any other expectation than that, you will be disappointed, right? So when we do this, we got to think of it in this way. Faithful people don't give what's left over, but they give what's first. And so I, again, I want to be as clear as I can. Faith is the only thing that matters to God. And he puts you in positions that will cause you to have to make decisions of who you trust. You know why Cain didn't give his first? Couldn't trust God. You know why he gave what's left? It's because he didn't trust God. You know why you're not giving the first of your time and the first of your money and the first of your resources and the first of everything else? I mean, I don't want you, I mean, I know you don't want to repeat it because you might be thinking it's you, but I'm just saying, like, why don't we? Because we don't trust, right? At the end of the day, we don't have, like, God, call me faithful. But, you know, I can't be. So he just says, I'm going to put you in positions, and that's what he's saying. If you want to be faithful, here's an example of what it looks like. Then he says in verse 5, by faith Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not uh, be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. Verse 6, one thing that we should make sure that we like go back, circle, get around because this is what I was just saying to you. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. The only thing that pleases God is faith. Not giving what's left or just showing up or just going through the motions or just checking off a box or just, you know what I mean? Like that's not, again, and I'm not, I'm not trying to burst your bubble or to be like, you shouldn't come to church. I'm just saying like, or you shouldn't read your Bible or you shouldn't give a little, you know, I'm not saying that, but I'm just saying evaluate your heart here because at the end of the day, he's trying to do something with you, right? He's trying to do something in you, right? And we're going to see why this is important later on, right? Because he's trying to prepare you for what's to come. And if you don't have the faith, this is the book of Revelations, now listen to me. So if you're out, checked out, listen to me. When what is to come, if you don't have the faith, the chances of you making it through are not good because it's going to keep getting harder. The, the, the persecution that's coming, the things that are coming are going to be difficult. And he already knows. We already know this, right? Jesus knows the decisions that your children are going to have to make in 10 years from now that you never had to make before. Like he knows it. And so he's saying, I'm going to get you prepared. I'm going to put this in front of you. I'm going to put this in front of me. I'm going to show you this. And we're going to, I want you to get it built up because I know you're going to be at a crossroad and I want you to be able to make the right decision because you have the right faith, right? So let's, let's build up those things because at the, only, at the end of the day, the only thing that pleases him is God, or is faith. Then verse seven, by faith Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he's commended, uh, he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness that is in keeping with faith. Remember we talked about irrational things? Like if, if you're gonna live by faith, you're gonna end up doing some irrational things. Think how irrational is this? Build an ark out in the middle of a desert where it's never rained before because the whole world's gonna be flooded. Right? And we look at that and we're like, who could ever do that? Right? But that's what he wants to build your faith to, that you would be willing to build an ark in the middle of the desert because you're trusting God to show up in the middle of a desert. That's how revival happens. Revival happens because God said, I'm going to be there if you're going to be there with me. Put it out in the middle of the desert. Nobody around you is going to see it, but I'm going to show up when you take steps. 
And when you get in the right place, I'm going to do what only I can do. When you do the irrational things, then people get to see the incredible miracles of God, right? But until you do it, until he can use you, until you take those steps, until you build an ark out in the middle of the desert, until you take the ridicule, because you know that, right? If you're going to live by faith, you realize that you're going to be made fun of. I'll speak from experience. There's tons of people who will look at you and say you are a fool. Remember that? Nobody leaves a good job and goes plants a church inside of a community that he doesn't know anybody and gets inside of a 60,000 square foot building that you can't pay the bills and you don't have any money coming in and go ahead and plant a church. Move your whole family over here and don't have an income, right? Walk away from a good income, walk into a place where you're not gonna have income into a place that already has 110 churches and add another one and see what God will do. They tell me people aren't looking at you like you are a fool. And it's not just people outside of the faith. It's the majority of the people inside of the church. Because people inside of the church too many times don't know how to live by faith. Right? And that's what he's calling us to do is to move into those places. Verse 8, by faith Abraham, when called to go to, a, go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents as did Isaac and Jacob, whose heirs were with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to a city uh, with foundations, those architects and builder is God. And by faith, Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful, who had made the promise. And, all, and so from this one man, and as good, who was as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. Listen, Abraham, same thing. How do you make a decision to leave a land and go to a place that you haven't even seen? How do you move out of the known into the unknown? That's faith, right? That's the story of Abraham. Here's the known. Here's where you live. Here's where your family is. Here's where your establishment is. Move into the unknown where you're going to have no idea other than the promise that God gave you, right? How do you do that? How do you get to those places? Because I think if you're like me, when you look at all that, how do I get that kind of faith? You ever wonder that? Like, how do you get the faith that when he tells you to do something that it's going to be like, I'm jumping, because wouldn't you say for a lot of people, they want it, but it's, they just don't know how to get there? Maybe. Like, do you want that kind of faith? Do you want the faith that would say, like, if he asked me, I'm jumping. I, I don't care if he asked me to move here and it's unknown. I don't care if he asked me to do this and it's unknown. I think for everybody, they're like, how do I get to that? Right? Well, here's what we need to understand. The reason they could get there is to understand this in verse 13. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw and welcomed them in from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on this earth. You know why it's so hard to have faith in the United States of America? You know why it's so hard for us to have faith? Because we judge success, we judge it working on whether or not we get to the destination. Did any of them make it to the destination? But everybody look at them like, you're just not successful because you never made it to the promised land. You're not successful because you never, you know, you never did this or you never did this or you never got there. And I'm like, you know why people, two reasons why people in the United States of America and inside churches today in America can't figure out faith. Because they think it's more about the destination than it is the journey. You see, the, the question isn't whether or not success is based upon getting somewhere or getting it done. Just like planning a church. Success in God's life for me was not how many people ever came to Life Church. You know what success was? Will I take the first step? Will I say yes to planning a church? Will I say yes? And it's just all of those things are the way that he's trying to work with me. Not of whether it's going to work or not work. Not whether or not there's going to be a lot of people show up or not show up. The question is, what is he trying to do with me? Are you willing to say yes because the, the end of it isn't like what he's trying to do for all of us is not, well, I don't know, I'll say yes as long as I think it's going to work and, you know, I've thought through the plan and I don't know about the plan. Who cares about the plan? The plan is, will you say yes? 
Will you just take a step? Because then God will do it. And the reason why people struggle with it, this is the other reason why we, we, we struggle with faith. Because you live like the only thing that matters are the things of this earth. Those people lived as a foreigner in this land. I mean, what's the worst case? This is one step of faith that for me fixed something in me. When I left Adams County and came over here to plant a church, something got fixed in me, right? When I came over here, I came with a little bit of money. You know, we came with a little bit of money, and I thought, you know, if it doesn't work, I still got a little bit of money, I can get restarted again. Within the first six months of being here, all that money was gone, and I had zero. With no chance of a paycheck, no chance of anything coming like we were at this place, you know, where essentially... I had lost it all. And you know what he fixed inside of me? I can gain it all and lose it all, and it doesn't really matter. And so where I'm at in my life today, I can make decisions of faith because I don't really care. I've been at the bottom, and I've been at the top, and I've been somewhere in the middle, and I don't really care because the things of these world aren't what I want to hold on to. I don't really care. I've seen myself. I've been through this journey. I have lost it all lost a lot of money, I've made some money, like it's went back and forth, but you know why you can go through those swoops? Because at the end of the day, you're a foreigner in this land. And the only thing that he's trying to do with you through all of that is to build your faith. Because he gives, he takes away, he gives, he takes away, like, I I can't keep control of that. Because the reason that we can't take, you know, he has to fix this in you. You know what he had to fix in me? Even though you think you're in control, you're not. You thought you were in control, like you made a little plan. I went ahead and blew up your plan. (laughs) And I'll continue to blow up your plan as long as you think you're going to be in control. Anybody that's tried to live by faith? You know, anybody that's tried to live in between? Like, I want to have faith, but I want to have a security blanket. I want to have faith, but I want something to fall back on. He's like, I'll go ahead and take that fall back on out. Because at the end of the day, if you trust me, if you're a foreigner in this land, Whatever happens isn't going to matter, right? That's what he's looking for when it comes to faith. And that, listen to me, now we're going to get into the Church of Philadelphia. That's what was happening in the Church of Philadelphia. That's why those people were considered faithful. Those people were considered faithful because at the end of the day, they were making decisions just like what we talked about. God was asking them to do things, and in asking them to do things, they didn't know the outcome. They didn't know how it was all going to turn out. They didn't know where it was all going to go. But because of their faithfulness, God was doing only what God could do. Right? And he looks at the church and he says that they were faithful. So let's look at the church of Philadelphia and see what we can learn from them. Back to Revelation 3, starting in verse 7. It says, to the angel of the church of Philadelphia, right, these are the words of him who is holy and true and holds the key of David. So he starts off with the beginning, a foundation, just like he does in every letter. Let me help you understand a character trait or a thing about him that we need to latch on to. The first one is, is that he's holy and so should we. Like, he is holy and true, and so if he's holy and true, so should the church, right? This idea that, that we've accepted inside of America is, is that we can love a holy God without striving to be holy is crazy. You know what I mean? Not that, again, we're perfect, but the question is, do you want to be more like him? Do we want to be more like God? Do we want to try to work on these things that aren't going so well in our life? Because if you believe in a holy God, you're going to want to be like him and be more holy right? Be or do the things that he wants us to be able to do. So he says from the beginning, if you get this, faithful people understand that I am holy and that we should strive to be holy. And I know that we're screw ups and I know that we make mistakes, but that's where grace and mercy fits in. But it doesn't keep us from striving for holiness. Then he also brings up a very key point when he says this, not only is he holy and true, but he he holds the key of David. There is only one way to God, only one way. And it's through Jesus Christ, only one way. And he wants to make sure that we get this because too many times inside of the church or inside of the lives of other people, we think there's other ways to fix our problems. The only way, this is what he established from the beginning, the only way to fix your problem is Jesus. The only fix to your problem is Jesus. 
If you want things to be right, it's Jesus. And he says, I am the key to God. I'm the key to the power for living. I'm the key for all of these things. So at the end of the day, you might be searching out other people, other things. You know, you might be searching other stuff on side of this earth. But what you really should be searching is me because I'm the key. Right? Get counseling, get in relationships, fix some of these problems in your life. But at the end of the day, the only one that's going to fix everything that's broken is Jesus Christ. And he's the key to all those things. So he establishes that from the beginning. Then he comes up and he says this, what he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. Right? So he, he establishes something. Jesus Christ is sovereign. Okay? Now to explain sovereignty, Right? It's this whole idea that at the end of the day that we operate inside of this world, but who's in control of this world? Jesus. Yeah, God. He's in control. Right? And when you think that you're in control, because this is what he's establishing, make all the decisions you want, follow me, do all these things, but at the end of the day, I'm the one in control. I'm the one that's sovereign. And when you finally settle that, because the reason that we don't make decisions of faith you know why we don't make decisions of faith? is because we don't trust that God is sovereign. Because once you trust that God is sovereign and he is in control, then why wouldn't you do what he tells you to do? Because you think you're in control. You don't think God is sovereign, right? You think you're sovereign. You think you're in control. And so in this, he establishes from the beginning, if you ever want to be a church like the Church of Philadelphia and you want to be faithful, the only way that you're going to be faithful is to settle something in your heart. Either you're driving the ship or I'm driving the ship, but we better decide this right now because there ain't sharing the steering wheel. There can't be two hands on, on the steering wheel. Like there ain't no sharing this thing. You know, and like, oh, we'll go my way for a little bit, and then you can go your way for a little bit, and it's in a fun joy ride. And he's like, give me that freaking steering wheel. <laughs> right? There ain't no sharing. Like, you get to sit in the back. Like, you get to be a part of the ride, but you don't get to steer. That's just the way it works. When you get that, when you're okay with that, you can make decisions of faith. But when you don't get it, and you try to share control, you'll just always, not always, most of the time you err on the side of making decisions of things you can control. Not that you won't make decisions, but only decisions that you can control. Hey, then he goes on and he says this, I know your deeds, again, because you were faithful, right? That's where he's at. I know your deeds because um, you were faithful. It doesn't say that in there, I'm telling you. I know your deeds and because of your faithfulness, this is what he's done. See, I've placed before you an open door that no one can shut. So there's this formula or this idea that goes together. If you are faithful, then God can do things. Jesus can do things that only he can do. But you have to be faithful first. When you're faithful, God opens up doors that nobody else can shut. You know what the first one is? Salvation. If you are truly a faithful believer of Jesus Christ, that door of salvation is open that no enemy can close. Right? And then he opens up the door. You know how like you've been praying for people? Well, let me rephrase that. I hope you're praying for people that are lost right now by name. And I hope you're grieving over the people that if Jesus Christ came back today, we're going to spend eternity in hell. I hope you're grieving over that. And I hope you're grieving because you know you've been going down these roads and it just feels like you can't, you can't get it to them. You can't, they won't come and they won't do. And you know what I mean? Like, have you ever been there? Like, you've been praying for these people and it's just not working? You can't get down these roads? Here's what he says. Be faithful and the door to the effectiveness of your ministry will be open. And at the right time, those people will walk through that door. You can trust that. You can trust that. You can trust that if you are faithful, God's timing is always true and right. Nobody else can shut that door, right? Nobody else can, can keep that from happening. Like he's gonna give you opportunities to reach people that you never had before. He's gonna give you power to reach people that you were never able to reach before. He's gonna give you words inside of your life that you've never had before. Like there's gonna be a power that comes with faithfulness, right? So he establishes that from the beginning. When you are faithful, these are the things that can happen. Then he says this, 
I know that I know that you have little strength, yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. So he says, I know you're a small church, but just remember this, the effectiveness of the church is not based upon the numbers of people, but the circles of faithful people that will make decisions to change the world. Numbers mean nothing. We already established that last week, right? On the outside, you have a reputation of looking good, but you really suck. Remember that was last week? Like you look good, but you're just going through the motions. Small pockets of people making decisions of faith will change the world. That was the Church of Philadelphia. Doesn't matter how big you are, right? Doesn't matter what that looks like. Then he also says that you not only kept my word, like you've, you've, you've read it, so that's why I always start. If you want to be able to keep God's word, you probably should read God's word because you can't keep it if you don't read it, right? So you need to read it so that you can keep it. But when you're reading it, you should read it with this expectation, God, what are you saying for me? Because I want you to tell me what to do. That's what I want you to do. I want you to tell me what to do. And then I'm going to keep your word. And when do, when, in keeping his word, it reveals our faithfulness, right? Because here's what you know about reading God's word. Do you realize that reading it and obeying it is almost impossible on your own power? Please shake your head that way. I know you're reading it. Because if you've really read it, that's really true. Like if you're saying, oh, no, then you haven't read it. I'm just saying, if you read it for what it really says and what it asks you to do, you can't get this done on your own. You can't keep God's word without the power of God in you right? Living by faith, you're never going to get to those places. So he says, I want, to con- I want to commend you because by faith you've done these things. And then he also says something which I think is very interesting, which he says, you've never denied my name. Now I want you to think about it in their times because it would have been just like Thaddeus. So have, in their times, they would have came to Thaddeus and they would have said this, like Thaddeus, you have a job at the local you know, uh, factory. And so we need to know, Thaddeus, you need to make a decision because if you are a believer, you can no longer work here. So Thaddeus out of his mouth would have to make a decision to either deny Christ or proclaim Christ, but it would have a huge effect by what came out of his mouth. Does that make sense? Right. This would happen back then. People would have to make that decision or Thaddeus would have been taken, they would have come and knocked on his door in these cities at the time, and they would have said, Thaddeus, step out, bring your family out, line your family up. Thaddeus, you have a decision. If you deny Christ, your family will be left alone. If you proclaim Christ, we will start with your youngest child and we will kill them until you deny, to the point that it gets to you. Thaddeus, what do you want to do? This was happening then. In fact, this happens today. If you don't know this, this is happening around the world, right? where people who say that they are believers are tested on whether they will or will not deny the name of Christ, right? This is happening. And we always wonder, like, what would we do? You ever wonder that? Like, what would you do? What would you do if you were lined up and your family was out there? You want to hope? You want to hope that you would have enough faith to say, I don't care. I don't care. The, mo- the most important thing. Like, you want to know, you want to believe that you would have that faith. But let's be honest, Right? How many of us would, right? And this is why I think, because here's what you're gonna see in those people's life that can make those decisions. It didn't start with that decision first. It started with this little decision of faith, and a little decision of faith, and a little decision of faith, and a bigger decision of faith, and a faith that's building, and a faith that's growing, and a faith that, and all of a sudden, I am a foreigner, and I'm a stranger in this land, and God has shown me that the most important thing is a relationship. You know what I mean? Like, it's grown to the point where then it's like, that is your life, or denying Christ. Be like, are you kidding me? I would never deny Christ. I've made enough decisions to understand that the most important thing in this world is faithfulness in Jesus. Why would I ever make a decision if I'm a foreigner and a stranger in this land, right? That if my home is somewhere else, then thank goodness he's just taking me home and he's taking my daughter home and he's taking my son home and he's taking my wife home and he's gonna take me home. Bring me home, (laughs) right? When we get foreigner and stranger in this land, take me home because this place is not where I belong anyway. And we'll celebrate in faith when we get to those places. But see, here's the problem in America. And this is what almost makes it worse. We proclaim with our mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, but live our life as there is no God. 
We are like Christian atheists. You proclaim Jesus as Lord because you don't want to go to hell, but the rest of your life as lived is lived as if there is no God. And we wonder, why do I can't figure out why my faith won't grow? Well, I don't know how to put it any franker to you because you're living like an atheist. And you can't with your mouth be like, I am a believer. Jesus Christ is Lord. I mean, but I mean, you can't my money and you can't my time and you can't my kids and you can't my job and you can't. <laughs> then why not just be an atheist? Because here, again, I got to be careful how I say this. Because you probably just are an atheist. I mean, just proclaiming Jesus with your mouth does not mean that you believe in Jesus or believe that there is a God. The actions of your life determine whether you believe that there is a God or not. Right? I mean, we... I just want you to hear that because we can say it, but if your whole life lives that that there isn't one, does saying it mean anything? And so I want for all of us to understand that inside of this, you might not be like what I was saying to Thaddeus, you might not be outwardly denying him in front of other people, but you're denying him by the way that you live your life every single day. You're denying that there is a God because you or living as if there isn't one, right? To be faithful, to get the type of faith that it takes when, when we see people make these decisions starts because you live as if there is a God. You raise your kids as if there is a God. You handle your money as if there is a God. You schedule your time as if there is a God. You right, like on and on again. And he's just gonna be like, and I'm gonna build your faith and you too will be the church that's called faithful because the little decisions of your life, right? The little things you gave to me and they got bigger. They got bigger because you know what I'm preparing you for? And I know you don't wanna hear this and you're gonna think I'm a doomsdayer, but that day isn't that far off. And how many of you are going to be prepared? Did I sound like a doomsdayer? <laughs> I'm kind of looking around at like how many people are like, what church are we at? <laughs> I'm just telling you, I think, and I think about this with parents a lot of times, like God sees right now, 10 years from now, what your kids are going to have to deal with. And I'm just telling you, it's coming. And I just wonder, are our kids going to be prepared? But are they, going to, are they going to be able to make that decision? Are they going to be asked, maybe for the first time in the United States of America, deny Christ or, deny Christ or? I think it's coming. I think those things are down the road, and I think we need to teach our children, we need to teach the people around us to be a church and to be a people, people that are faithful because down the road, we don't want them to be put in that position and those who deny me on this earth. Anybody know the other part? If you deny me on this earth, you'll also be denied in heaven. I hope we get put in a position and I hope we know and I hope that's why I keep, you know, I always say like, God, keep testing me because <laughs> I know this day is coming. I'll take the test because I know this isn't my home and you keep robbing me of stuff on this earth, but you know what? I'm going to go through the grief and I'm going to be like, I don't like what you're doing, but at the end of the day, I know what you're doing. I know what you're doing. I know something else is coming. I know you're preparing me for something else. I know how you want me to respond to this and have faith inside of these things. I know those things in my life. So he gives me that. And then he also goes on and says, and I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews, though they are not, but are liars. I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I have loved you. Remember in this as we end up, there is an enemy that's gonna try to defeat you, but the enemy has already been defeated that on this earth you're gonna live as a Christian in faith and they're gonna be people that make fun of you, people that persecute you, people that are gonna to try to bring you down. But at the end of the day, he says, someday, whether it's on this earth or, whether you, when, or when you stand in front of Jesus Christ, the enemy will bow at your feet. The enemy's already been defeated. 
You need to claim the victory in Jesus because the enemy's already been defeated. Don't live on this earth as if you've been defeated by the enemy. Victory is in understanding that with persecution and with hardness and with a difficult life comes victory because at the end of the day, the enemy can try to persecute, but we are already victorious in it. Right? He already says the enemy will bow down at our feet. And then he goes on in verse 10 and he says, since you have kept my command to endure Patiently, I will also keep you from an hour of trial that is going to come on the whole world to test the inhabitants of the earth. So he gives this picture like I'm preparing you because at some point there's going to be a test. Tribulation is coming, you know, and know that because you endured, because you did all these things, you're not going to have to suffer through tribulation when everybody's faith is going to be tested when it comes to that day. So he talks about tribulation. Then he says this and he ends it with this. So the worship team uh, is going to come back up and I want you to listen to what he says at the end. I am coming soon, so hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. Here's what he says. Listen. Whether you want to do this or don't do this, this goes back to the sovereignty of God. You need to understand that he's coming soon. And I know for a lot of you that's a hard concept because you've never lost anybody or you've never been around loss, you've never seen death, and you're really young, and you're like, I mean... (laughs) not dying. I mean, other people die. My genetics, we're good. You know, we don't have those kinds of issues. And so you don't really face death that much. You don't really think about like tomorrow could be your last day. Today could be your last day. This could be last moment on this. So they don't think so much about that. But don't always, don't ever forget this either. Jesus is coming back. Young people, listen to me. Maybe you will never see death. You know, and, and again, when I, when I think about this, I want you to know that it's not like I'm like, hey, you know, I know the date and Jesus come back. But, but I did think about this when we were in Chicago watching Stephen's Grace played in Chicago. And I went with Stephen to, and Lexi to watch and we were there. And, and as we were doing it, Lexi was talking about this I think she called it a meme. I actually don't know what it's called. But anyway, it was a picture. Have anybody seen the, the I Am Legend movie? So in the I Am Legend, it's like the zombie apocalypse, you know, and this guy's running around. And there's a picture of him and his dog, and then in the backdrop, his gas price is at like $6. <laughs> and so beside it, they put a picture of the gas prices here today and be like, look, look, at what's coming. It's kind of funny, but it's not funny. <laughs> You know what I mean? I'm not, I mean, I'm, I want to say that it's funny when you look at it, but it is a reminder that is coming. Not gas prices. <laughs> Jesus is coming back. That is coming. You can't avoid it. I don't care what your age is. You might be alive on this earth and he comes back. And the question are, are you going to be found faithful? Are you doing the things on this earth to be found faithful? Are you operating in a way to become faithful? Because at the end of the day, like the church in Philadelphia, all that matters is that we are faithful. So we don't want to be found on the wrong side of those things. Can you stand so I can pray for you? So Heavenly Father, as we come together, um, And recognize, Lord, that it's difficult to live a life of faith as we always want to be in control. So, Lord, I'm just going to continue to pray that you give us the strength to overcome those things. Give us the strength to understand what it means to be faithful. Help us get and and understand what it means to live a life by faith. And give us the courage to do those things because we know that in that you're going to open some doors that nobody can shut. We know inside of that we're on the right side being with you and that no enemy could ever defeat what we're doing. So Lord, we love you and we just ask for your grace and your mercy and your strength to live and be faithful. Lord, in your name we pray, amen.
begins to fall. On the name of Jesus, I will call. For I know my God is in control. Purposes are shakeable. Doesn't matter what I feel. Doesn't matter what I see. My hope will always be your promises. from last week, Holy Spirit come. I really want this song to, to enter our hearts today, knowing that the Holy Spirit is here, He is coming. Let's sing this out. And I'm coming with the heart of worship. I'm bringing in a brand new song.
when you get to these places, you know, God has this stirring up inside of us and you're just like, I want to be faithful and I want to do and I want to be a part of and I want to be on the right side of all of this, then just do what the song says. Holy Spirit, come, fill this place, flood my life and I will do whatever you ask me to do and I guarantee you will be found on the right side of faithfulness. I guarantee you that he will use you and your faith will build and the Holy Spirit working inside of you and you will see the glory of God through those things. So again, we're just praying that that's what we're like. We're found on the right side of faithfulness that we'll live by faith with the Holy Spirit just flooding not only this place, but our lives. So thanks for joining us on our main campus. Thanks for joining us online. We'll see you guys next week.